So good morning. Welcome, everybody. It's great to have all of you here. My name is Scott. And I'm, as uh, Alex said, I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, it's, I'm just excited to be able to share with you today. Last week, Caleb did a one-week series um, uh, out of Ephesians chapter 4, and I'm going to do part two of a non-one-week series. Uh, I'm just going to tag on. What happens for me is when you know, I was already scheduled. Like I knew going into last weekend that I would be speaking this weekend. And he, he basically said, you can do whatever you want. But what happens is when I'm sitting there in the front row and he's sharing and I get the idea of where he's going with this, then my wheels start turning. So I open up my phone and I start making notes. You might think I'm playing Angry Birds or sending a text of my watch to Aaron like I did earlier. Uh, which does happen, but I'm usually working on notes and copying scriptures and thinking about if I were to speak on this topic, what could I bring to the table? That's really the question that I asked. Uh, you know, is if I'm going to talk about out of Ephesians 4, let me open up to this. Ephesians 4.1 starts here. And Paul said, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Okay, that was where Caleb started last week. We could do, you could do an eight-week series of what this means. And in reality, every week we're talking about this. Do you realize that? That it, it's about living a life worthy of the calling that you have received. And it's easy to think that, like, somehow this is geared toward like the elite or the leaders or those who have titles. But really, we're all called to live a life worthy of the calling. You go, well, I'm not called to anything. Yeah, you are. <laughs> and if you read Paul's letters, he opens up his letters to the, to the elect, to the called, to the chosen, to the saints in Ephesus. And he's not talking about the elite. He's talking about regular people just like us that were all called to this, whatever it means to live a life worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So I'm going to tag on to this. I want to recap one more little piece of what Caleb talked about last week out of Ephesians 4, if you want to open up to that, because I'm going to read a lengthy section. I'm going to read the second half of that chapter. Ephesians 4, 11, and this is the verse that kind of gets all the press out of Ephesians chapter 4. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. For what purpose? To equip the saints, that's all of us, for the work of the ministry. And here it is, for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God to maturity to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is the point. That's why we gather together. We gather to worship together. We take communion together and to be built up and then to go out into the world and serve. I mean, we're only here for, you know, 90 minutes, you know, on a Sunday morning. And the rest of our life is spent out there walking it out, okay? Okay. So Caleb talked about being fully mature means that, that we live a life of service. And I would add to that, because that's what I do, is service, and I would say of sacrifice. That we live a life of service and sacrifice. And those two, I think, are inseparable because sometimes my serving is a sacrifice. You know, we all only have so much time. And I have less time now than I used to have being semi-retired, you know, and working nights. I'm working tonight at 7 o'clock, and I'll work until they tell me to go home because tomorrow is Labor Day. Isn't that ironic that we get off on Labor Day? I just think that's funny. But sometimes our serving, and I would say most of the time, our serving is a sacrifice. When we think of sacrifice, it's easy to think in terms of money, and there's an element of that for sure, that when we give, uh, that it can be sacrificial, but scripture calls us to, to grow up in every way into him. And then when each part is working properly, that we're functioning together and we're all using our gifts together. So uh, again, last week, Caleb talked about the Metron. That's the way you have to say it. Did you know that? 
Metron. Sounds like the name of a transformer, I think. So last week when he was pouring these coffee beans in here, did you notice they were like falling everywhere? I have a front row seat, so I was watching them fall. And I, I turned to Bonnie, I go, those are missionaries right there. They're going, they're being scattered. They're being scattered across, across the universe. <laughs> I better not throw them at the communion thing. Here we go. Here's, they're being scattered. Called to go out into the world. Scattered. You know what? One coffee bean by itself doesn't make a cup of coffee, does it? It takes, I don't know, a decent amount. They have to be ground properly. They have to be roasted properly. You ever, have you ever seen where they grow coffee? Can you bring up that first photo? Look at this. So my dad, God rest his soul, he passed away about 10 years ago. Uh, he had a timeshare in Acapulco. You ever saw, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, it was an Elvis Presley movie, some Acapulco, right? And he did cliff diving. I saw that cliff that he dove off of. It was scary. Go Elvis. Um, but I had this idea. Being a coffee drinker, I started drinking coffee. My, my grandfather, who was blind, uh, lived with us. Uh, my grandma passed away, and so my dad brought him into our house, and we sh all shuffled around and shared bedrooms and all that. And my grandfather, you know, he couldn't really do much for himself. And so we would make his breakfast, his lunch, his dinner, and I would often make his coffee. And <laughs> God bless him. It was a jar of Sanka. Remember Sanka? It wasn't cool like Starbucks decaf and these little skinny things, right? This was Sanka with the orange lid, right? And it was the, the crystals, right? They're frozen crystals. And so it's a decaf coffee. So you had a, a, a jar of Sanka, a container of sugar, and a container of uh, like Cremora, which is demonic, by the way. Okay, it's an abomination to the Lord. I'm just saying that. And I'm serious. I'm not just kidding. Um, there's a reason why God invented half and half. So, uh, and so I would make my grandpa's coffee, you know, heat it in the tea kettle, the water, and then a, it was a teaspoon of Sanka, a teaspoon of sugar, and a teaspoon of Cremora, stir it up. And it tasted exactly the same every day, but every day I would take a sip. I mean, the water was always the same temperature. It was heated to boiling, right? But I would, I would taste it. And I was, you're talking like I was 12, 13 years old when, when we started doing this. And wouldn't you know, when I went off to college and I started drinking coffee, guess how I drank it? Well, no, no I, I elevated from Sanka. I knew it was demonic back then. But uh, yeah, so I, I still drink my coffee today with cream and sugar, although it's more like skim milk and sugar-free vanilla <laughs> at this point because I'm trying to slim down. But... Um, so I was always intrigued about coffee. You know, and it's funny, you go to exotic parts of the world, like you go on mission trips, and they serve Nescafe, which is almost the same as Sanka, like out of a can. And I go, You're, you've got the best coffee in the world. You know, I went to Rwanda, and right next door is Congo, and they, yeah, in Kenya, it's right there, and you have great coffee, but no, you're going to serve us Nescafe, you know. So anyway, I wanted to take my dad on this adventure. Because my, my dad and I had an interesting relationship. You know, he was old school. You know, uh, I'm an elder Gen Xer raised by hardcore boomers. And, you know, it was children were to be seen and not heard. And it, I, re, I figured out early on that if I just made good grades and I didn't get caught doing what I was doing, I was in good shape, you know? And my dad was a great provider and supportive and whatnot, but he was, he, uh, you know, he, he had this voice like this, you know, and he would, you know, oh, grumble, grumble, right? And he was a state farm agent, and for some reason, I mean, we had like 18 kids. So there was five in my family, five kids, my parents split, and then my dad married a woman with four kids younger than me and my grandpa. So it was chaos all the time. And for some reason, he built on two rooms onto our two-story house that 
Incidentally, I used as a ladder to sneak out because I could walk out of my bedroom onto the roof of that, that brand new office and climb down the antenna. I was creative, you know. Uh, you know, and it, I just, God bless him. He, he was just, he was just old school. And so I had to really work through issues of forgiveness when my, he and my mom split up. And, you know, I carried that baggage into when I became a, a, a Christian, gave my life to the Lord and all that. Uh, and what happened was then I just decided later in life I needed to just give my dad a break. There's a word for you. You know, I realized that he was raised by parents that were different than him and he did the best he could. And so I decided I was going to, if I was going to get my needs met from my father, I was going to have to do it. I was going to have to go, this is what I need, and have a strategy, this is how I'm going to get it. Okay? And so we, we were in Mexico at this you know, beautiful, I mean, this resort was killer. It was great. You know, the zero depth pools and... You know, it looks out over the ocean and the, the Pacific that far south is warm. It's really nice and it's wonderful. And I said, hey, dad, uh, how would you like to go on an adventure? This is how I decide I'm going to connect with my dad. Let's go on this adventure. He says, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go see where they grow coffee. You know, I'm in Mexico, right? And so he, he had a driver uh, when they were there that he would call. It was kind of like an early version of Uber, right? His name was Ishmael. And uh, so he introduces me to Ishmael, and I, and I describe what I want to do. I go, well, how, how far is it to where they grow coffee? And, and he goes, well, it's about two hours to the mountain, and then it's up the mountain. And he says, let me, I have a friend. Let me get back to you. So the next day, he brings his friend, and he goes, so what do you, you want to do? And I go, well, I want to go. I'm going to take my dad, and I want to go see where they grow coffee. And he goes, I go, can I, can I like, rent a car? And he goes, oh, no. You don't go up there alone. They don't know you. They don't like you. They kill you. <laughs> and I went, okay, I'm in. So, so uh, we, we put together this, this whole trip, and we go up there, and this guy was former paramilitary. If you ever saw Romancing the Stone, you know, the guys that was chasing Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner around, you know, the... The, man, the mustache and the cigar. That was basically the checkpoint that we went through. And my dad thought it was, I mean, they have, they're holding like M16s, right? And there's like 15 of them and we're in this cab, you know, going up the mountain to Ise. And my dad thought it would be a great idea to pull out his camera. Yeah, he's a tourista, right? I'm like, dad, you might want to put the camera away. I don't think these guys want their picture taken. So anyway, we get up there, and I see this. Okay, now you can bring up that picture. I'm actually going to refer to it now. That's what it looks like. So we're climbing this mountain. It's a lane and a half dirt road going up this mountain. And he goes, here you go. Here's your coffee. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, it's right there. And I go, where? He goes, right there. So I climb out of the cab, and it's like shrubs. Just growing along the side of the road, like money on trees. And it was like, well, that doesn't look like coffee. It looks like cranberries, you know? And so anyway, we go to it. We actually make our way up to a coffee plantation. And what they did then, they would, they would, uh, they would harvest the red berries and can, go ahead to the next photo. So, and it would look like this, you know, mostly ripened. And they're, they're, they look like grapes, Right. And so then what they do is they take them and they spread them out. They had big cement pads. Like if there were no chairs in this room and this was in the middle of, of the mountainside. And what they would do is they would just spread these berries all over. And the sun, the, the sun would actually dry them out and the husk would pop like this. And then they would put it in a, a, a shaker and the husk would fall off. And you're left with beans. Of course, these are roasted. And the unroasted ones look sort of like a yellow, green sort of color. And then you take them to a roaster and you roast them and we make coffee out of it. And I kind of joked, you know, that you can't really do much with one. You could plant them. I was reading about, can, you, can I grow a, a coffee plant like in my house? And you, you can. Go ahead and bring up the next photo here. I think this is a really good picture. You might think this is a stretch. Stretch. 
Let's go back to the last photo for a second. This to me, when I see that, you know there's a scripture that says, neither, neither can anyone snatch them from my father's hand. You know, right? And he's and talking about Jesus talking about us being secure in the Father's hands. That's kind of what I see. And then go to the next one, and then you bring it down that we're a bunch of individuals in this thing called the body of Christ. Can't do much with one immediately. Doesn't do much, although anybody like chocolate covered espresso beans? I, I thought about eating one of these, and I went, yeah, I think I'm going to pass on that. Caleb had his hands all over him last week. I'm not sure what they. And I thought, you know, he's got the whole world in his hands. And how he really does have us secure. And you know, Metron, this container, when you think biblically, it's a it's a unit of measurement. And I asked Caleb, you know, sort of rhetorically, what how do you measure maturity? You know? What does it mean to be a mature, well, start with just being a mature person and then becoming a mature follower of Christ? That it's really hard to measure. But there are, there are indicators along the way. Like how's the economy doing? And you look at interest rates and prices of things and all that. There are measurements, and it's not about age. You hear the, the old saying, I hope I grow up before I grow old, right? That maturity, it comes with a level of emotional maturity where, where I don't react to things crazy. I'm a little more careful. I watch what I say. I, I watch how I live my life. I try and, you know, live, live in kind of a, a safe way. And it's easy to look at this and think, well, it's just, you know, ministry, it's about filling slots. And yeah, there are slots that need filled. I mean, if you strip away all, of a, all the people who serve here on a Sunday, we wouldn't have lights on, there wouldn't be any sound, nobody to bring up the photos, there wouldn't be anybody in kids' ministry, all that. You, and you, you know that. But it takes all of this working together to accomplish whatever it is the Lord has called you to. Because the reality is I can't accomplish everything the Lord has called me to by myself and neither can you. That it takes all of us working together. What it takes to pull off one food outreach, it takes a couple of people and a very expensive truck to go to the food bank to pick it up. To, somebody has to unload it and then you have to sort it and then you have to bag it and then you have to have people come and then we go out there and then we eh, set up and registration and all that. You know, they say if you, if you can accomplish your dream or your mission by yourself, you're not dreaming big enough. And I know in, in my case, in my life, this is very true. I mean, I started, I started serving. Uh, Bonnie and I, we got married. I was pretty young. I was 23. Uh, we moved from New York City to Eaton, Ohio. I started teaching in a in a senior high class. I had 12 kids. I went in the bathroom and threw up my first Sunday morning. I was so nervous. And I just went in and I told stories and I would, I would talk about, you know, the, the major themes of the Bible. And I still do that. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of a main and plain guy. Uh, I think I'm deeper than most people would give me credit for. I just present in sort of a whimsical sort of way. And I think the depth of who I am can get lost in that. I'm kidding, by the way. Um, but it started just teaching kids. David and Goliath. Y'all know the story of David and Goliath. Well, and I always answer the question, so what? Or what does this mean to me? Well, David and Goliath, what's, what's the giant in your life right now that you need to battle, that you need victory over? Noah and the ark. What does that have to do with today? Well, for me, Jesus is the ark. And I climb into him and he saves me every day, mostly from myself. You know, people love to blame their stuff on the devil. And I go, I don't need the devil to get me in trouble. I can do that just fine on my own. Let's look at this. Uh, Ephesians 4. I'm going to quickly read through this uh, verses 17 through the end of the chapter there. Now, this is Paul. 
okay? He's, and he's starting to transition from, to a new point. He's saying, okay, let me take this a step further. He, so now, this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Now keep in mind, from their standpoint, the writers, there are two groups of people, Jews, the Jewish people, and everyone else. Non-Jewish people were Gentiles. It was just, it was just a fact, okay? So he's saying for all this, uh, remember, um, does there, in the futility, yeah, no, no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorant, ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. They've become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned in Christ. So see, he's now starting to get down to it. He, in other words, he's saying, you know better. They're not, they don't know. They don't know the truth, as it were, but you do. But that's not the way you learned in Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. And here it is, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Boy, you talk about holiness. You talk about people who talk about that and it becomes this long list of don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion, most people don't need me to stand up here and tell you how you screwed up or give you a long list of sins, right? My goal is to encourage you to something better, to put off your old self and to put on your new self. And now Paul starts getting down to it, down to the specifics, which the practical things, which I really like. He says, therefore, again, now Paul's gonna make his case. Therefore, I've said all that, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. And I always like what Doug used to say, the truth was never meant to be a club. Hello? Club, right? Don't beat people with it. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. It's okay to be angry. Don't sin in your anger. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands that he may have something. Why? Why are we supposed to work? To have something to share with others in need. We're not supposed to just consume it all on our own stuff. We're supposed to have enough to share. That's really the work of the church is to care for one another. You tracking with me? Okay. Let no, ooh, here we go. He's getting down to it now. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. And this is what he ends this chapter with, this thought. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. In the very next chapter, in chapter five, Paul makes one, one statement. He says, and don't get drunk with wine for that's debauchery. And then he makes this statement, but be filled, be filled with the spirit. That we're supposed to be filled with him. And of course, that's a whole nother message series. You accept Christ, you get the Holy Spirit, right? It seals us for the day of redemption and all that. But then we talk about there's a spirit in you and then the spirit will come upon you. Christina talked a couple of weeks ago and she says, if you're struggling with this, ask for more of the Lord. And some people struggle with that idea. Well, don't you get the whole thing? Right? And I go, if God's infinite, do I have all of that or is there always more? <laughs> I think there's always more. I've been around a long time now and I'm continually learning, continually growing, sometimes against my will. And the Lord's going, Scott, I'm not finished with you. Yeah, you finished with me a long time ago. 
no, Scott, we need to talk about this. Ugh. Paul also wrote a book called Colossians as a letter to the church in Colossae. To them, that's to the Lord's people, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of, of this mystery. Like that? Uh, that's deep. The, he's made known to you the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Man, accepting Christ gets such a bad deal. And it's mostly all of our fault because we make it out to be like, well, you just need to get saved, you know. And, and again, the truth becomes a, a club versus talking about how he changed my life. I was headed in this direction and he changed me and I started going in this direction. Having no clue that I would end up here. I was fine teaching my little class to 12 high schoolers, throwing up before that, <laughs> struggling for hours to come up with something that I thought would encourage them. I had a record burning. You know, in the book of Acts, it said they had a 50,000 drachma fire and people took their books of witchcraft, you know, and they burn it in the city square. You know this passage? That's not in the notes. That's the director's cut. But man, I was frisbeeing Duran Duran and Madonna and Neil Young and we burnt all my records and I had to buy them all on CD when I got older. <laughs> and now I don't even need those. Think of the money I could have saved. But for me, I needed to do that. I really did. For me, it was a purging. It really was. So how do I live out attaining to the measure of the fullness of Christ? And I, I highlighted it as I was reading in 14 through 31, or 17 through 31, it was simple for me to put off the old self and put on the new self. That I deny myself these things and I focus more on these things, doing the, the next right thing, being kind when I don't feel like being kind, being gentle when I wanna just go off on somebody of being generous when everything in me wants to hang on to my stuff. I have a neighbor. I got to op open up my cash app. God bless cash app. I got a cash app request at 12.28 for $4 for a pack of cigarettes. Uh, A.M. In the middle of the night. And then I'm, fo I'm forced into a decision. And sometimes I say, look, I'm not an ATM. Like you go over and put your card in Scott and spits out $4 for whatever it is. It really doesn't matter to me what that need is. And for some people, that is a need. For her, that is a huge need. She said, I was pacing around. I don't know what I'm going to do. And she's really anxious about it. And sometimes I give just because I need to. Because we're called to live a life of sacrifice. And sometimes it is a sacrifice. You know, both our cars got hit in one accident in front of, right in front of our house at 5.15 in the morning. Car coming this direction, facing our cars. We're on this side of the street. They're coming down this side. They, they veered left, went left to center, and sideswipe, hit my car head on, knocked my car, and then sideswipe both our cars. Total both our cars. Now, we have two nice cars, but they're both 10 years old. Parked out front, you go, why you got two nice cars? I go, yeah, they're 10 years old. I mean, somebody wants to buy me a new car, I'm, you know, more Lord. I'll take it. Yeah, I like that laugh over there, Bonnie. She knows I'm serious. It's easy to try and boil righteousness and holiness and maturity to what we say no to. And there's a huge element of that. Especially if you have addiction issues or struggling abuse in the past that you've never worked through and that kind of leaks out and you know you unload on people all the time or you're just unhealthy and you know we all have stuff and I'm convinced that us becoming mature Christians it's like it's not just one thing it's like a five lane highway of different things that we all need to work on part of us part of it is us gathering together some of the major Healing in my life has come when I've been at a conference and, and I got ministry 
or even conferences that we hosted. And I'm just broken. I had a lot of baggage to work through when I was a kid. Tons, tons of baggage. And then I took my dad to go see where they grew coffee. You know, if he was here, he'd, he'd go, oh, let me tell you a story. And I go, oh, here we go. He's going to tell the story about the six-foot iguana. So Scott gets out of the car to go see where they grow coffee. And there's a six-foot iguana there. He ran off like a little girl. <laughs> and I did. I saw that thing. And I hear this. I thought he was coming after me. I was envisioning, like, wrestling an alligator. You know, ah! Do not get drunk with wine. That's debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. And the point of it isn't, it's not, it's not so much don't drink the wine. It's, it's do this. When you're filled with the Spirit, that's less attractive, you know? Doing those other things. Putting off your old self and putting on the new self. And here's the thing. When you put on your new self you, and you have the Spirit, it starts, the Spirit starts producing fruit called fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. A fruit of the Spirit is me controlling those desires. And you know what? I also control the things that I'm going to do that are good. You follow me? It really comes down to choices. I know, just say no which was a miserable failure, by the way. Just say no, just say no to drugs. But the point is, it's how we, it's what we value and it's how we live our lives and it's the things that we choose not to do and the things that we choose to do. And we're all faced with those things. In that same passage, when, ta- when Paul is talking about the fruit of the Spirit, he says, he says, you know, the works of the flesh are obvious, They're obvious, you know, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. There's something for everyone in this. Selfish ambition, dissension, factions. Tell you what, watch yourself through this political season. Right there, factions. And even believers who believe differently than us. It's easy to, you know... To think we're the ones who have it right. You know, and those people, well, I'm not sure. I, I do a lot of funerals. I do a lot of funerals. And people inevitably say, well, he said, you know, Uncle Bob said he was, or Grandpa Joe said he was a, a believer, but he didn't go to church. Or, but, you know, well, you know, they were Catholic. And, you know, and I go, yeah, well, you know, read in Romans. It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You'll be what? Now we know that. And we say we believe it until moments like those. And we get all like, but they didn't go to church every Sunday. Or they only went Christmas and Easter. And I think it is important for us to be gathered together. I mean, this is what I've given my life to. But I think it's important that we gather together to worship and to build one another up and to get filled up like it's an aircraft carrier and you land and you get fuel and you get ammunition and you go off on another, on another mission. That's what we're called to. We're, we're called to be scattered. Choices. Any of you familiar with a website, Eat This, Not That? You ever heard this? Write it down. Eat This, Not That. If you, it's a concept, which is a, a, it's a brilliant concept. If you're going to have a burger, get this burger, not that burger. You know that McDonald's has a kale salad that has more calories in it than a Big Mac? Isn't that insane? Oh, not me. I'm eating only salad. And you're eating 1,100 calories of salad versus a 980 burger. Well, I'm going to eat the burger then. Choices. Paul said this. This is one of my one of my favorite verses. In Colossians 3, he said this. And whatever you do, because Paul uses this theme about 
attaining to this measure of maturity and the fullness of Christ through his letters. It's his theme. He's, he's called to encourage the church because they don't, they don't, it's not like they had a rule book. They had the Ten Commandments and they had the law. And now it's, it's a new, read Romans. You want to blow your mind about, this is a new contract that we're under. That's why it's the Old Testament, the Old Agreement, and the New Testament is a new agreement. We're under a new set of rules. And when the Gentiles started coming on board, they didn't know what to do with them. Well, should, should Caleb be circumcised? Because, you know, he's not Jewish, he's a Gentile. Should he be? And they go, how about we not burden them with that kind of stuff? How about we just say, don't eat meat with blood and avoid sexual immorality? I like, hey, I like those rules. He has a lot of latitude, doesn't it? But they just, we make it out to be like this long checklist of don'ts when I think it's more about what we should be doing. Paul said this, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So think about this. Whatever you do, whatever you do, and whatever you say, what doesn't that include? <laughs> That's that's everything, right? Whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, Caleb facilitated communion today. And Jesus said, I'm setting an example for you. He washed his disciples' feet. And that was like the low job. The lowest servant in the house washed people's feet. What a nasty job, right? But Jesus being the, the Messiah, being the Son of God, being the Christ, and they recognized him as that, he washed his disciples' feet. One time, we were doing a, uh, a little event, and it was, a, it was like leading up to, um, to Easter, and it would have been you know, during the Passover the week before. And we were doing a thing where you could come in at lunchtime, and we'd have music playing, and... and our prayer team was here and would serve communion. And so uh, I was sitting in the front row and Valerie, is Valerie here? Valerie Sorrell, is she here today? She has been on our prayer team for a really, really long time. I was at her wedding like 25 years ago. And she knelt down in front of me and was praying. And she said this, she said, Scott, Jesus wants you to know that he would have washed your feet too. Whew. I was wrecked. It wrecks me just telling you that. Because that, I, I have a sense of how humbling it must have been for the disciples to have Jesus wash their feet. And just the mention, the thought of him washing my feet was, was mind-blowing to me. And Jesus said, look, I've set an example for you to follow. Like, this is, my, this is my last act. Do this in remembrance of me and remember that I washed your feet. And if I, your Lord and teacher, he said, you call me Lord and teacher, and that's right, that's who I am. Jesus didn't have an identity crisis. You call me Lord and teacher, that's right, that's who I am. And now, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And then he says this, I've set you an example. And if you do this, you'll be blessed. So the question is, what does it mean to wash one another's feet today? It's the same question as like, what's the Goliath in your life that you're battling right now? Whose feet can you wash? What would it look like for you to wash your neighbor's feet? If Jesus took the Bible, here's Matthew. Eh, it was close, Matthew 14. All this, he encapsulated when asked what is the, the greatest law, he said, well, you know, what is it? And he said, well, to love the Lord your, your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what's the second? It's like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. He encapsulated all of that. He said, all the law and the prophets can, can come down to, to those two statements, loving God and loving people. Then the question is, how do we walk that out? And the answer is, I have a lot of ideas about it. I know things that I've tried. I have a, a neighbor down the street, uh, who's going through some stuff. One night, uh, I was out on the porch, and he, he and his adult son uh, came and sat down, and Bonnie, Bonnie got us something to drink, and we were sitting out there talking, and he starts pouring his heart out to me about what he's going through. 
And just, a, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what it was, but take what you might imagine and multiply it. Like when somebody's in trouble and he's in trouble. And so we're talking and, and I offered to help. I said, well, I know people. And, you know, I could make a few calls if you want. Let me know. I was on the community police council for a while and I know all kinds of community leaders and, and I'm happy to help you with that. And I said, you know, we talked about getting together. You know how easy it is to say, hey, let's get together. Let's do breakfast or let's, hey, let's, hey, let's do coffee sometime. And it never materializes. And a year later, and this happens to me all the time. Hey, we talked about getting coffee together. Where you went? And it just never materializes. I'm like, look, if we don't set a date, it's not going to happen. It just, it just. So finally I said, look, we talked about getting together. And he asked me if I played pool. And I went, eh, uh, my brother, my sister and brother-in-law have a pool table. We play, you know, on holidays. And so I, I said, well, how about if I call you next week and we actually make this happen? So I had my Tuesday off and I called him and, and I took him to this pool hall up on Needmore Road and I ordered, I, what do you want? And he goes, well, I, <laughs> I got to go see my parole officer so I can't have anything to drink. And I went, okay. So, so he ordered Cokes and I ordered him wings and nachos and, you know, mozzarella cheese sticks. And I put out this buffet and we played pool and I hung out with him. I didn't pry and he didn't bring up a lot of stuff. And on the way home, I just said, how you doing? How you holding up? He went, I'm doing okay. Thanks for doing this. For me, that's how I try to love my neighbor. It's just spending time, paying for it, being available, showing support through things like that. Listen to this verse out of Philippians. Now, Paul also wrote this. He wrote this from prison. Keep that in mind. And he says this, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself what? Say it. Nothing. How about that for a life goal? A mission statement. Scott, what's your mission in life? Make myself nothing. He made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even on a cross. And I want to remind you that on the night that Jesus was being betrayed, he went out after he washed their feet. They had a Passover meal. Judas goes off and he's going to betray him. And he has the disciples and they go to the garden. And he goes, you guys wait here. I'm going to go over here and pray. And he comes back and they're asleep and he kicks them. Come on, guys. I, I told you to watch and pray. Peter, watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation. And he goes back and prays and he comes back and they're all asleep. And then the accusers come and they arrest him. When he was in that garden, he said, basically, Lord, if there's any other way. Because <laughs> he knew what crucifixion meant. And he knew that's why he came, but I still find it really interesting that he said, Lord, I know that there's no other way, but if there's another way, that he was obedient even unto death. So what does this have to do with us? Okay, my last couple of minutes here. Again, focusing on, on Paul. And I'm, I would say he's referring to when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He wasn't there for that, but I'm sure that spread. Like, I can't believe Jesus, you know, especially after Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus washed our feet and he set this example. Now, how do we live this out? And so Paul, in Romans, he wrote this. He said, look, we, we have different gifts. According to the grace, there's that word grace that Caleb talked about, given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. Okay, if you think you have the gift of prophecy, the gift of encouraging people, practice it. Just, I've been thinking about doing a live, a live uh, stream where I just say, need encouragement? I'm not gonna call it, I'm going to go to prophetic words with some mystical music and a, you know, some space looking James Webb telescope image behind me. Ooh. No, it's going to be, hey, you need encouragement? I'm more likely to have Tom Petty playing. 
learning to fly and giving people encouragement. If, if your gift is prophecy, prophesy to the person when you're waiting in line at Kroger or at Speedway. You know what I love to say? Hey, I love your wheels. Those wheels are awesome. Are those custom? Uh, and they look, uh, yeah. but you say the right thing, you see somebody perk up. I had somebody tell me today, hey, nice shoes. Yeah, Nike Dunks, Pandas. I wore them just for you. And you know, when somebody acknowledges something like that, that's really, right? And so just, it, prophecy is about encouragement and giving comfort to people who need it and who doesn't need it. If it's prophecy, prophesy in accordance to your faith. If you have this much, we'll prophesy that much and maybe just a tad more. If it's serving, then serve. See, in all this, we're all called to be encourage, uh, encouragers. We're all called to serve. Teaching, if, you, if your gift is teaching, then teach. If it's encouragement, give encouragement. If it's giving, give generously. We're all called to serve. We're all called to, to encourage others. We're all called to give, but there are people who have these specific gifts that just, they have faith for it. I've built my gift of giving over time, mostly to combat my selfishness. And because I have a value for giving. If it's leading, do it diligently. If it's showing mercy, do it cheerfully. You know? You know the people who have a gift of mercy. They're like, oh, man, how are you? You tell somebody else you're probably, oh, well, like, wow, thanks. I'm glad I shared that with you. You know, that's when you go, oh, this is a good time for me to be merciful. Well, how are you doing? And I'm so busy a lot of the times, I have to actually go, hit the brakes, stop, come back and go, hey, you know, you shared something with me. I don't think I, I like when I'm with somebody, I want to give them my full attention. And it takes everything in me, right? Because I'm like the squirrel, what? But I know I'm not different from, from you all. I know we all struggle with all the same stuff. So I started off teaching high schoolers. I led worship in a small group for a dozen people. I started teaching uh, a junior high group and then leading worship uh, for junior high. That's fun, doing Pharaoh, Pharaoh and songs like that. And I would take the big songs they did in what we called the big room and I would lead them for the kids, you know, weave those in along with uh, the other ones. Um, then it became, hey, we're gonna plant a church and I'd never run sound, never had a, sound, a soundboard, never played in a garage band before. I didn't know the difference between an input and an output. I mean, it was really, but I found people. What I was really good at was finding people who were better at stuff than I was and, and having them, you know, letting them or empowering them to do what they were called to do. Man, I had people, you, see, here's the thing. What you don't know was what it took to get into this room. There are wires that go all the way up and over and underneath and making sure everything's plugged in. And even every week, what it takes for the band to pull off a seemingly, I mean, they make it look easy. To pull off a 30 minute or 40 minute set is hours of listening to the songs and practicing. Practice is what you do at home. Rehearsal is what you do as a band when you're together. And the, you know, the, the curriculum that's being created and the time spent and the cleaning, we agonize. Oh, I went in a staff meeting, you know, we, what, what went right this weekend? What went wrong? I went in the ladies' room and there was no toilet paper installed too. Oh, you know, and we agonize over those things. But it takes people and it takes resources to do those things. My goal wasn't to become an assistant pastor or whatever. You know, I was a worship leader. And then Doug would be on vacation and he'd go, hey, can you do the message next week? And I'd go, sure, if you think I can do it. Sure. See, when, when something that you're passionate about and what you're interested in and the skill set that you have, your talents, your, you know, when everything, you know, kind of meets in the middle, that's your sweet spot for serving. If you're a school teacher, you may not want to come here and teach, but you can serve coffee. Ah, I'm not with kids. Here's your coffee. God bless you. Uh, tomorrow's school, but not today. That's okay. 
You have people who go, well, I really don't want to pray for people. That's okay. You don't have to. Just come and put food in a bag. Can you do that? Because we can't, we can't do it all. And this is not where I send you to the website or pass out a sheet for you to sign up. I hope that you're inspired to do something. And not just here. Oh, I got to find this verse. <laughs> I got to share this though. I had a note in here. I'm, I'm good. I'm good at a lot of things. I can say I'm good at a lot of things. There are some things I am terrible at. Want to know one of them? With terrible? Bonnie, what would it be? Hanging things on the wall, right? Say amen. Amen, yeah. She's holding back because she could go, yeah, yeah. I mean, I just, I, I just hate, I can say I hate doing stuff like that. I hate hanging things on the wall. I hate painting. You know, we have a fence that we're going to power wash and, she, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm just not, not great at that. We bought a house that was built in 1899 and it was pretty much unlivable when we bought it. And we spent six weeks, had a contractor come in and, you know, and got the whole thing together. And there's one bathroom, there's a, they were putting in a new full downstairs bathroom kind of sandwich in between the kitchen and the living room. And the door they put on didn't have a doorknob. We've been in this house seven, almost eight years. And just earlier this year, I put a doorknob on. So we'd have people over for Thanksgiving. And you know what we did? We put a hand towel through the hole. And it kind of kept the smell in there and made it so people couldn't see in. And it gave you something to wipe your hands on and close the door with, right? And I put a doorknob on. No, no, no. You don't understand. This took hours of research multiple YouTube videos, multiple trips to Lowe's to get this doorknob, and I didn't tell Bonnie I was doing it. And she came home from work, and she went to use the restroom. Ah! There's a doorknob. I went, yes, I did that. <laughs> Hi. It's like Tom Hanks. Hi. Have made doorknob. Not good at it. Some of you go, what's the big deal? Like Tommy? Oh, yeah, I'll come over the house in five minutes. I'll have that doorknob. Like, for me, it's five days, $37, five trips to in agony and sleepless nights. But I got it done by the grace of God. I did it. All that to say, you know what? Serving isn't always fun. You think the band wants to show up here at O Dark 30 on every Sunday morning? You might go, oh, they're so deeply spiritual, though, and, you know, and they just get to be in the presence of the Lord. It's all true. You still got to drag yourself out of bed, take a shower, drink some coffee or whatever, and get here on time and be ready. And there's a lot of pressure that goes with that. Matthew 10, and I'm going to land this plane. Look at this. Two seconds, one second, I'm there. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. For we are God's workmanship, his handiwork, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for all of us to do. Would you stand? And here's the point. I think as we, as we serve, as we sacrifice, we become more mature. And the people around you, will, they will tell you that they see a change. It's not about, only about what we say. It really isn't. We can make it, well, I don't do this and I quit swearing or whatever, and that's all good. But people around you who know you best will see the change in you and they'll begin to affirm that. And you'll begin getting invited into things. Like in my family, it became, hey, Scott, do you want to say the prayer at Thanksgiving? Or, hey, then somebody said, would you do this, do this funeral? Or, hey, whatever it is, fill in the blank. And I would just say yes with boundaries. But I would say yes to as much as I could. Just, okay, well, if the Lord's going to invite me into this, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Final word. Jesus said this. He said, I'm the vine. 
which made me think of the coffee. I'm the vine and you're the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. And the fruit of that is the blessing. Jesus said, if you wash one another's feet, you'll be blessed. Now that you know these things, if you do them, you'll be blessed. There's blessing that goes with living this life that I'm trying to inspire you to. Where you give your life away. That you don't hoard your resources, that you're generous. It's okay to be wise. It's okay to say no. Just don't be selfish. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path that shows us the way we're to walk. Your word says, this is the way, walk in it. Help us to do that. For folks who have maybe straight off the path or have never stepped on that path, Lord, I pray that you would draw people in right now by your spirit. Thank you for setting that example for us. Thank you for making it plain. that There's a, the mystery of Christ in us. There's that mystery, but yet how we walk it out, what it means to love people, to love you, Lord that you made that clear to us. Thank you that there's, there's room for each of us to be individuals, to use whatever measure of faith we've had with whatever gift you've given us. But it all goes back to you, Lord, that you would get the glory. And I pray for each one of you. I wanna leave this decanter down here. And if you wanna grab a coffee bean or two or three and, and just have them as a reminder to just do small acts of kindness, that you're important. You can feel free to come up and uh, take a couple of beans. Thanks, Lord. I just feel like I should just like speak benediction over you that grace, mercy, and peace through God, our Father, His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit would rest and abide with each of us now and forevermore. Amen.